um, um, profoundly as well. Um, but before I go into that, I will be um, again uh, saying a few words about the formalities, uh, especially for those people who might be joining us on YouTube. Um, so as you, most of you know by now, uh, the, this year's Ouroboros seminar is uh, organized jointly by the Mind and Life Europe and the uh, Institute in the Making Metanoia, and is part of a beautiful broader initiative um, uh, of Mind and Life, which is centered around two anniversaries, namely the 20th anniversary of Francisco passing in 2001 and the 30th uh, anniversary of the uh, publication of the uh, Embodied Mind. Another thing that I would like to mention is the, the overall structure of the seminars. Uh, again, for those of you who might be joining uh, us for the first time. So after a 20 to 40 minute presentation of the uh, selected paper, we'll have an approximately 60 to 90 minute discussion. I will be moderating the discussion, so I would kindly ask you to all the potential questions via personal messages here. So you just find my name among the participants, uh, scroll down and send the message, the uh, question that you would like to ask. Um, and if for some reason you would like me to read the question, you can say so, um, you can put that in parentheses. And questions can also be asked um, on the YouTube channel, so on the YouTube stream, there will be uh, one person, Victoria, who will be passing on the questions to me. And if there's time, I'll, I'll try to um, um, ask them for you. Now, most importantly, please try to make questions cl short, clear, and sweet. That is to say, to the point. Um, and uh, one final uh, thing. So um, due to the time difference between Europe and uh, Japan, our next meeting uh, will be held exceptionally at 10 uh, a.m. Uh, CET, Central European time. So uh, Tom Fruse, the next presenter, is currently residing in Japan. And this was basically the only um, uh, possibility that we could find. Very inconvenient for all of those who are joining us from the States. Uh, and I apologize for this. Uh, and again, this is um, only this is the only uh, exception of this uh, sort. Um, and now I was thinking um, that for the presentation of the presenter, <laughs> uh, instead of myself doing this, uh, I might ask uh, a person who knows uh, uh, the presenter way better and might present, might do the job way better than I would do it. Mm -hmm. uh, um, <laughs> namely, uh, I'm talking about Amy Varela. Uh, Amy is a chairperson at the uh, Mind and Life uh, Europe board. Um, and she has played a central, essential role in the organization of this, um, of this uh, 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 seminar series. And I would just like to, before I uh, uh, give, pass the word to her, I would just like to do what I should have done in the first session already uh, and thank Amy. So thank you, Amy, sincerely for all the work, all the help you've done with regards to this. Uh, <laughs> and you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, thanks for that. And now I will just um, pass on the word to you so that you can present Evan. Uh, in your own way. Well, someday, thank you, Sebastian. Someday we'll have to write a little paper on how we hatched this together. Maybe so, maybe. This little egg. Um, but thank you very much. And, and uh, welcome to everyone who's here today watching. Um, I'm true, uh, truly a long-term good friend of Evan, and it's an immense honor and a pleasure to welcome him to this series of the Uroboro discussion series. So thank you for all for being here and thank you, Evan, for being with us. So this is Evan's bio. He's a writer and professor of philosophy at the University of British Columbia, where he's also an associate member <clears throat> of the Department of Asian Studies in the Department of Psychology and Cognitive Science. He works on the nature of the mind, the self and human experience. 
His work combines cognitive science, philosophy of mind, phenomenology, and cross-cultural philosophy, especially Asian philosophical traditions. He is the author of Why I Am Not a Buddhist, Waking, Dreaming, Being, Self and Consciousness in Neuroscience, Meditation and Philosophy, Mind in Life, Biology, Phenomenology and the Sciences of Mind, and Color Vision, a Study in Cognitive Science and the Philosophy of Perception. He is the author with Francisco Varela and Eleanor Roche of The Embodied Mind, Cognitive Science and Human Experience. And he's currently working on two books, Dying, Our Ultimate Transformation, and with Adam Frank and Marcelo Glazer, The Blind Spot, Experience, Science, and the Search for Truth. Evan is also an elected fellow of the Royal Society of Canada. So now on a more personal note, Francisco Varela met Evan Thompson in 1977 by way of his friendship with Evan's father, William Irwin Thompson, who founded and ran the Lindisfarne Association. Lindisfarne was a confluence for interdisciplinary exchanges between scientists, scholars, contemplatives, and artists. Its mission was, in Bill's words, the study and realization of a new planetary culture. When they met, Evan was 14, Francisco 31. Their friendship took root during the year Francisco spent as Lindisfarne scholar, a scholar in residence, sorry, following Gregory Bateson's tenure as scholar in residence there. At first, this friendship grew something like a mentorship. Evan says he saw Francisco as a big brother or a young uncle. And as Evan progressed in his studies of Eastern philosophy and philosophy of science, the friendship blossomed into a close working partnership that lasted until Francisco's death in 2001. Evan was at his side just days before he died. So I feel very fortunate to have been close to this friendship, this alliance that engendered profound work and really truly effervescent conversation. And I'm grateful to Evan for the work and friendship that endure and for accepting our invitation to be here today and to tell us about this essential enigmatic text, not one, not two. So thank you very, very much, Evan. And thank you all for being here. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. I think uh, I need to share, <clears throat> excuse me, I think I need to share my screen so that you can see my slides. So just give me a second to try to do that. Make sure this works. Okay, is uh, that visible to everybody? It is. Yes. Marvelous. Okay, good. Okay, well, um, it's it's really a pleasure to be here, and um, I'm really looking forward to presenting this paper and to and to having the discussion. This is a, a very rich paper. If you um, have had a chance to read it in advance, or you know the paper, you'll you'll know exactly how rich it is. It's 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 long, it's complex, and it has many many uh, dense and interconnected thoughts. So I'm going to actually. Uh, need to take a fair bit of time to unpack it. And I'm going to do that by way of saying some things about the background and context for the paper. It really helps to understand what's going on in the paper if you, if you know some of the background and context. And that will lead into just a little bit about my personal story and my connection to Francisco from the period roughly, um, beginning from the period roughly when this paper was, was written. And then I'm going to flow into uh, the content of what I want to present. And that is the content that really leads into the heart of the paper, not one, not two. And you know, I'll highlight these things in the outline as, as we come to them. Okay, so the background and context, this paper, not one, not two, was prepared as a position paper in advance for a conference on mind-body dualism that was held at the Wheelwright Center at the Green Gulch Zen Center in Marin, California. And the conference took place in 1976, July 27th to July 30th. And it was organized by Stuart Brand and Gregory Bateson. These were the participants at the conference. I won't read through all these names here, but you know some of them will jump out at you. Gregory Bateson, 
Um, if you know about second generation cybernetics, Gordon Pask, Heinz von Forster, Terry Winograd, um, very uh, important figure in the work on artificial intelligence in the 70s and 80s. And so this was a gathering of, of these people and the paper that Francisco prepared in advance was eventually published in the Coevolution Quarterly in the fall issue of 1976. The invitational paper that Gregory Bateson wrote to the participants for this conference, you can read it online here. And I'm going to quote some things from this paper because it, it really gives a sense of the larger context within which Francisco was, was thinking about, um, you know, the ideas that he presented in Not One, Not Two were in a sense addressed to this context of the conference as set out by Gregory Bateson in this paper. So Bateson wrote, I have given the name mind body to the aggregate of matters, which I hope we shall discuss. But I hope that our deliberations will be shaped by an agreement at the start that at least the following list of topics is only a listing of synonyms, names, or other ways of approaching the same central concern, evolutionary theory and epistemology, mind body, cybernetics, ecology, and indeed theology and ethics are labels for different paths which all lead to the same problematic mountain. I hope also that we may agree at the start that the problematic nature of what we are to discuss has been grossly increased by those philosophies and religions which divide the mind from the body. He then went on <clears throat> to list five points that were to serve as the basis for the discussion. And it's important to um, mention these points because they, they very much connect to the substance of, of not one, not two. So first is that phenomena, percepts, events, data, injunctions, descriptions, etc., are commonly linked together in recursive systems and or subsystems. Secondly, that energy, is commonly available in such systems to be triggered by events whose energetic content may be large or small, zero or negative. Third, that it is characteristic of the biosphere that the triggering events or variables are commonly differences. Four, that differences of whatever sort are always at one remove from the paired or multiple events in which they are imminent but not localized Differences thus precipitate news of difference, and this news or information may be of various levels or logical types. The map is not the territory, and the rules of coding by which the map is made and by which it is read are not the map, etc. So this is um, often summarized by Gregory Bateson in this idea that information is a difference that makes a difference. And then Finally, the above four characteristics of our subject and subsubjects of discourse apply both to that which we would investigate and to ourselves as investigators. So these idea of recursive systems, the biosphere, information as difference that makes a difference, the, um, the application of these ideas, not just to observed systems, but to ourselves as investigators, these are all, of course, taken up in not one, not two in Francisco's own way. Okay, so these ideas, oh, I'm having trouble advancing, give me one second, there we go. These ideas um, figured in Gregory Bateson's book, Mind and Nature, which was published a few years later in 1980. And this brings me to a little bit about my personal story in connection to these ideas and, and, and this time. Sorry really having trouble advancing properly. Here we go. Okay, so I first met Francisco at a conference called Mind in Nature. This is a um, report of the conference that is from the Lindisfarne Association newsletter. This conference, Mind in Nature, was organized by Gregory Bateson and my father, William Irwin Thompson. And it was one Gregory Bateson was living with us as scholar in residence at the Lindisfarne Association in Southampton, Long Island, and was working on the text of Mind in Nature. The picture there at the bottom here 
You can see uh, Francisco more or less in the center of the picture um, with his legs crossed. And then the person, the large person with his back to the camera is Gregory Bateson. And my father is sitting um, immediately next to Francisco on his right. A few other pictures from that conference. This is Francisco talking with or laughing with Mary Catherine Bateson, the daughter of Gregory Bateson. And then the other photo is my father in his presentation and then Francisco and the physicist, David Finkelstein. And this is me from the same period, the same conference, the same event. So that's just a little bit about my connection to when I first met Francisco. So this was one year after the paper, not one, not two. Okay, so next, the logic of paradise. Now, here the connection is a talk that Francisco gave the following year at Lindisfarne in 1978, Reflections on the Chilean Civil War. This was also published in the Lindisfarne newsletter. And if you want to listen to a recording of Francisco giving this talk, you can find that here at this site. So this is a, this is a marvelous um, archival material from the Lindisfarne conferences where you can, where you can actually hear Francisco give this talk. It's, very, it's extremely moving. And in these reflections, he talked about how he felt that, um, that things had been pulled out from under him during the coup by Pinochet and the overthrow of Allende's government and how there, there was a kind of collective um, craziness that, that took over in the whole society. And he said, you see the craziness, the way in which there was a collective pattern in which I was responsible, everybody was, and in which my views couldn't anymore signify anything except that piece of a larger puzzle for which I didn't really have any answer. And then he says, I sat down and wrote some 20 or so pages that I entitled The Logic of Paradise, because it seemed to me for the first time that this had a logic to it. The whole thing had an intrinsic logic that was essentially good in that it gave me a handle on what paradise is for the first time. I know that might sound strange, but that is what it felt like. That being rooted in the complete chaos and mass killing, out of that was emerging a completely inverse understanding and I was too scared or something to resist it. So somehow it just got transformed into those pages. He goes on and he says, we must incorporate in the enactment, in the projecting out of our worldviews, at the same time, the sense in which that projection is only one perspective, that it is a relative frame, that it must contain a way to undo itself and that is how he ends the talk. He says, if I'm interested in doing anything at this point, it is in creating a form of culture, knowledge, religion, or politics that does not view itself as replacing another in any sense, but one that can contain in itself a way of undoing itself. Now, you might think that this doesn't have anything to do with not one, not two. What's, what's the connection here? But there is a connection, and the clue to the connection is in an interview that Francisco gave around the same time that he wrote Not One, Not Two, that was actually published also in Coevolution Quarterly before Not One, Not Two. And in this interview with Donna Johnson, he says, if everybody would agree that their current reality is a reality, and that what we essentially share is our capacity for constructing a reality, then perhaps we could agree on a meta agreement for computing a reality that would mean survival and dignity for everybody on the planet, rather than each group being sold on a particular way of doing things. Thus, self-reference is for me the nerve of this logic of paradise. That is, the possibility of a common survival with dignity of humankind. That paradise is something very concrete, founded on the logic of self-reference, on seeing that what we do is a reflection of what we are. This is the other aspect of my interest in having a full grasp of what self-referential descriptions are, how we can make them approachable, handleable, meaningful. Now, I've never seen the pages that Francisco wrote that he called the logic of paradise, 
But Amy tells me that she has them in Francisco's archive and that they're in Spanish and that they appear to be an early version of not one, not two. So there are two key ideas I want to take. And, and this is why I've gone into this background in the way that I have. The first is that being able to see things that are normally taken to be separate and in opposition as rather being inextricably involved with each other. So that's the general notion of dialectics that's at work in not one, not two. And shifting to this kind of perception requires moving to a meta level. So that's first idea. Second, we need to do these things if we're to understand how we construct, or as we would later say, enact our world. And this understanding must include understanding how we can undo that way of constructing or enacting things. I think this idea is especially pressing now today in that we obviously face, for example, a planetary climate crisis, and we're struggling with trying to figure out how to undo this situation that we've created. And it's an open question whether actually we will be able to do that, I think. All right. This brings me now to the title of the paper, not one, not two. So I'm moving into the paper now itself. Not one, not two, or bui buar in Chinese, is a stock phrase of East Asian Mahayana Buddhism. My suspicion, I don't know this to be true, but my suspicion is that Francisco took the title or took the phrase from this book, Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind. This book written by Shunru Suzuki, the abbot Suzuki Roshi of the San Francisco Zen Center was based on talks he gave in the San Francisco Zen Center in the 1960s. And Francisco knew this book. Francisco's Buddhist teacher at the time, Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche, was very close with Suzuki Roshi and they exchanged students. And Francisco told me that there was a picture of Suzuki Roshi in the meditation hall at Naropa. So I suspect that this may be where Francisco may have first encountered not one, not two, because this is what Suzuki Roshi writes at the very beginning of the book in the first talk. He says, now I would like to talk about our Zazen posture. When you sit in the full lotus position, your left foot is on your right thigh and your right foot is on your left thigh. When we cross our legs like this, even though we have a right leg and a left leg, they have become one. The position expresses the oneness of duality, not two and not one. This is the most important teaching, not two and not one. Our body and mind are not two and not one. If you think your body and mind are two, that is wrong. If you think that they are one, that is also wrong. Our body and mind are both two and one. We usually think that if something is not one, it is more than one. If it is not singular, it is plural. But in actual experience, our life is not only plural, but also singular. Each one of us is both dependent and independent. So notice the themes of mind and body, singular and plural, and dependence and independence, as well as the invocation of actual experience and bodily posture as expressing non-duality. So these are all themes running through the paper, not one, not two. One other thing to mention here is that in not one, not two at 2.3.1, Francisco mentions parenthetically that the Buddhist idea of the middle way comes close to what he calls the philosophical superation, the overcoming of dualities that he's presenting. He also mentions Sufism as well. And Francisco had recently been studying Nagarjuna and Madhyamaka or middle way Buddhist philosophy. And I know this because Francisco and I talked about this book, Emptiness, a Study in Religious Meaning, which is about Nagarjuna and Madhyamaka, one of the first books in English dating from I think 1967. Um, on the philosopher Nagarjuna. And, Fra and Francisco and I talked about this book a lot at, at the time that I, that I knew him then in the 1970s. So it's quite possible that um, this was also influencing his thinking in Not One, Not Two. All right, so now to the paper. First of all, just 
the structure of the paper. It consists of a short introduction that isn't titled as such, and then it has two principal sections, notes on dialectics and an epilogue on the mind-body problem. And the motivation is stated in the introduction. Francisco says, if there is going to be a change in our perception of the mind-body relation, there has to be a change in the context in which the problem is seen to arise. So what exactly does that mean? It means we have to change the logic we use to understand dialectics and wholes. And so this is the focus, of course, of the biological theory of autopoiesis and the calculus of self-reference and the arithmetic of closure that um, was talked about in Lewis Kaufman's presentation last time. We have to change our scientific ideas about mind. So mind not as in the head, but instead as what Francisco here using Gordon Pask's term calls a conversational domain and also as distributed to the stable interactions occurring in the biosphere. So later this becomes the ideas of an action and sense making. And then we have to change our cultural conceptions of mind. You could also say our cultural practices. Specifically, we have to include the kinds of experience and training that are central to meditative traditions, which for Francisco particularly meant Buddhism. And of course, this becomes a major theme of the embodied mind and then also of, of Francisco's later work on neurophenomenology. All right, so first section then on dialectics. So I'm gonna go through the, the principal sections of this uh, portion of the paper, beginning with what Francisco calls the star. So the starting point of the paper is a conceptual movement from dualities to trinities which means contemplating how apparently opposed pairs like mind and body are related while remaining distinct. So the Trinity then is the implicit third perspective from which we look at pairs as not one, that is they are distinct and not two, that is they're mutually implicating and hence inseparable. In other words, they're not disjoint. Francisco says, well, Yes, but we need a procedure to find this Trinity stance or to implement this Trinity stance. And the slash stands for this. Francisco introduced it as a bit of notation. And he says, what it means is consider both sides of the slash. So notice the self-reference. The slash refers to itself in referring to what lies on both sides of it. And he says that we're going to call this whole expression the star statement. So the trinity then is the star statement, which is the it and the processing or the processes leading to it. So the slash is to be read as consider both the it and the process leading to it. Consider both the left-hand side and the right-hand side leading to it. The next step is to show that there is actually something that this, uh, let's say procedure, this notation and the concepts behind it can actually do, that is that, it, that it's effective. And here that means that it, that it does give us a way to go from apparently disjoint pairs to their unity in a meta level. And so then we can use it to reformulate dualities like mind and body. And this brings us to the section called star cybernetics. And what he does here is he uses a direct or what we would now call a directed network graph as an illustration of how the star is effective. So we have the star as a, as a, um, as a formal structure, I suppose you could say. And now what we're gonna be concerned with is considering both the network and the trees leading to it. That is the trees constituting the network and this is Francisco's diagram of a network and the trees. And notice that this particular network that he's drawn is an example of a network having organizational and operational closure. These are terms that come first in the work on autopoiesis with Umberto Maturana. And the idea of a network having organizational operational closure is that it consists of mutually connecting and influencing elements that close back upon themselves. And this is the defining feature for Francisco of an autonomous system. 
And I imagine that many of you have seen this lovely um, diagram that Ezekiel De Paolo created to illustrate operational closure, where the, the black circles are processes that we observe and the black arrows, all the arrows in, in, indicate um, enabling conditions between processes. And the black circles form part of an operationally closed network of enabling relations. Each black circle has at least one arrow arriving at it and at least one arrow coming from it to another black circle. And it's embedded in a larger web of processes. This is actually a very important aspect for our thinking because Francisco says, whenever we distinguish something like this, that's an act of indication in the sense that we were talking about last time with Spencer Brown's work. So the observer sees in a complex tangled web of processes, something that stands out for it as having closure. But of course, the beauty of this also is that a system with this kind of closure, as it were, asserts itself in relation to the observer because of the um, entangled and self-reinforcing, you might say, um, processes at, at work in relation to each other. In the interview with Donna Johnson that I mentioned earlier, Francisco puts this by saying, the whole is more than the sum of its parts, it is the organizational closure of its parts. Okay, so now the question then is, we have a network and we have a tree, and how do we go from one to the other? So Francisco starts off by talking about how we go from the left-hand side of the slash to the right. And we do this basically by, as he says, chopping the network. We take one of its nodes as the initial element. So in the tree structure, A is our initial node. And it's important to note here that in an operationally closed network, a network having organizational operational closure, any element can be taken as the initial one. We chop it and make A the start, which is to say that chopping presupposes a chopper with interest in chopping in a particular way and a time, we might even say a context or situation, at which the chopping is done. Now it's trickier to go from the right-hand side of the slash from the tree to the network because we can't just write out the tree because that will never take us back to the network as a whole. We just stay with a branching structure. Even if we return to node A at some further point um, down in the story of the writing, we don't, we don't recover the network as such as a whole. So what Francisco says is, well, to do that, we have to eliminate time and we have to take the recursion to the limit at infinity. And then he says, we get the network back as a fixed point of the recursion, as a, as a fixed point of the, of the recursive function. So this is an interesting difference in passage between left and right that involves time and um, the elimination of time or taking something to a limit at infinity. All right, so to summarize, we have the network as a timeless whole, that is all nodes and arrows given simultaneously. We have the tree growing in time when we cut the network at a particular node. And three, we need each side to make sense of the other. And then four, the star is what gives us this perspective. Now notice that when we look at things this way, we have shifted to a meta level in the sense that we're able to transit back and forth across the two members of the pair, the network and the trees constituting the network. And we're able to see them as not one, they are indeed distinct, but also as not two. They, they require each other so they aren't disjoint. In the next subsection of the Notes on Dialectics, Francisco uses the STAR framework that we've just gone through to reframe dualities. And the idea here is that we place the whole, or what is holistic, on the left-hand side of the slash, and on the right-hand side, we put the corresponding processes or constituents. And he lists a number of dualities for which we could do this, some of which are at least to my eyes, amusingly dated. So right, intuitive, left, logical, um, 
very much, you know, the sort of popular discourse of right brain, left brain that even then Francisco was extremely critical of. Um, female, male, um, some of these I think we, uh, we might not look at in quite this way today. Um, but in any case, it's meant to give an indication of how um, certain apparent dualities can now be recontextualized or retreated in this, in this star framework. So in each case, the idea is that they mutually specify each other and become a unity as a second order whole when seen from a meta level. And we have a procedure now by which we can shift, namely the star framework, by which we can shift our perception into this, into this mode. Okay, so then in the next subsection, we shift to thinking about evolution in terms of this framework. And evolution here means how dualities evolve both logically, but also temporally. And Francisco's way of talking about this is to introduce a contrast between what he calls Hegelian dualities and star dualities. Now, I'll just say by parenthesis there, we could have an interesting discussion of whether Hegelian is really actually accurate to Hegel's own thinking here. Um, that's actually an interesting question, um, but I'm not going to go into that now. This is, I'm just going to note that we could have that discussion, but Francisco contrasts what he calls Hegelian dualities and star dualities, and this is how he represents this. So the idea is that Hegelian dualities are oppositional or antagonistic, um, and the logical operation is negation, whereas the star dualities are overlapping and asymmetrical, and the logic is um, self-reference. So um, that just summarizes actually what I just said. The idea in the star case is that the levels are imbricated, as Francisco says, that is they're overlapping, and one term of the pair emerges from the other. The model he gives is predator-prey, where we might think of predator-prey as oppositional, but then predator-prey can become basically the right-hand side of the star ecosystem and species interaction leading to the ecosystem. And so this is meant to illustrate how apparent opposites become the right-hand side of a larger mutually implicating structure when we see the star proceeding dialectically. And Francisco generalizes this in terms of what he calls the interpretive theorem. He says, for every Hegelian pair of the form A, not A, there exists a more inclusive star where the apparent opposites are components of the right-hand side. And the highest iteration or version of this, he says, is the universal star, reality levels of reality. So this is, as it were, kind of moving an attempted movement to a kind of maximum generality of apparently opposing structures that get um, subsumed into a larger star framework and viewed not as opposing, but as mutually implicating from a meta level. And then this would be the sort of maximal um, case of that. All right, section four then, subsection four of Notes on Dialectics is called epistemology. And here what we do is we turn back to reflect on ourselves as observers. An observer, Francisco says, is characterized as having a capacity for indication. So for example, drawing um, boundaries or, or deciding on boundaries. A capacity for time, that is a moment when you can intervene and cut a network or you can start a sequence or, or start a computation and a capacity for agreement. In other words, we can reproduce each other's indications, we can follow each other's timed actions, and so on. So an observer is um, some, some person or some system that um, has all of, these, all of these capacities. So of course, then we're dealing with the dualities observer observed, Describe, but that should be describer described, not describe described. Describer described and subject object. We now apply the interpretive theorem to these dualities. And that gives us, Francisco says, a conversational pattern. He's using Gordon Pask's term here. 
and the star conversational pattern participants of the conversation. So remember with the slash, it's consider both the conversational pattern and the participants of the conversation leading to the conversational pattern. That's how we have to read this whole thing. And this is, you could say that that, that gives us the mind-body pair as one form of this conversational pattern star where mind is conversational pattern, bodies participants. So we have to see this as consider the participants in the conversation, the embodied participants as it were, as generative of the pattern, namely mind, in this self-referential, imbricating and asymmetrical way. The tendency, however, Francisco notes, is that we as conversation participants tend to cut ourselves out and detach ourselves. That is to say, bodies with certain kinds of brains give rise to conversational patterns, but lose sight of their doing this and then fall back on themselves as isolated and rigid participants. And this can happen in all sorts of ways through, um, through fixated belief systems, through ideologies, through neuroses, et cetera. And just as a parenthesis here, for a vision of language in this, as we now call it, an active tradition that I think um, really works with these ideas and, and elaborates them in an extremely rich way. I refer you to this book, Linguistic Bodies, um, by Ezekiel Di Paolo and Elena Kufari and um, Hannah Di Jaeger. And um, this is something if um, in the discussion, if Ezekiel is here or Hannah is here um, that they, they want to comment on, I, I'd be very eager to hear that. Okay. so. An aside I also want to make, Francisco doesn't really do it this way, but we could apply the star to the mind-body pair this way. So we have the mind slash body. We read that as consider both the mind and the body leading to it, which we have to understand in the sense of the already minded body gives rise to the mind, which then transforms the body. Here, Imbrication and self-reference mean that we can take the whole mutually specifying pair mind-body, mind-slash-body, as a level in a ladder of increasing degrees of complexity. And then we do this by putting it on the right-hand side of a new pair, a new slash environment slash mind-body system. So from a dialectical perspective, then we get that transformation. We get a tr transformation from the star mind slash body to the star environment slash cognitive system. And that is in essence, the logic that I follow in my own work in mind and life. I don't, I don't state it in mind and life in terms of the not one, not two paper, but that's basically um, the logic that I'm, that I'm exploring, especially when I talk about in the book, what I call the body body problem. Okay, so last section of notes on dialectics, um, Francisco calls paradigm. And he highlights the paradigm shift that happens when we put side by side our understanding of nature and an understanding of the process through which we arrive at this understanding. In other words, when we refuse to bracket out the observer and the actions of the observer. And so this is a key principle, of course, of second generation cybernetics, generally speaking, in the work of Gregory Bateson and Heinz von Forster. And remember the context of the meeting um, where this paper is being presented. Francisco puts this by saying, there's a strong sense of the observer coming to the foreground, right? The observer is usually bracketed out. The observer is usually hidden in the background or actively occluded. Um, this is actually, part of the theme of the book that I'm working on that Amy mentioned in the introduction with Adam Frank and Marcelo Gleiser, the, the, the blind spot. Michel Bitbull has also written a lot about this. So in contrast here, there's a strong sense of the observer coming to the foreground. And of course, for Francisco especially, we connect back to action and politics. Remember the logic of paradise. We have to now explicitly recognize 
that we must take responsibility for ourselves as observers. That is how we decide what boundaries are, how we chop networks, how we implement this in social practices, in technologies. And unless we do this, we can't undo it. That is we can't, unless we see how we construct things, we can't undo how we construct them. Okay, so last section then of the paper is the epilogue on the mind-body problem. We have from the foregoing two ideas that we can apply to the mind-body problem. We have, first of all, the star logic, which we could say is in the case of mind and body, an already minded body giving rise to mind, which transforms body which transforms mind. This is always looping through the always already organism structured environment, which transforms the organism, which transforms the environment, etc. And secondly, we have the idea of mind as conversational domain. And that basically means mind as not in the head, but as distributed in the biosphere, that is as ecologically embedded, or as we later say, by histories of organism environment coupling or the idea of cognition as sense making. These are the other terms that Francisco uh, uses in his, in his later work when he's basically talking about the same thing. But Francisco notes, this doesn't solve the problem, the mind body problem, because there remains an unaccounted for residue. And this is experience, the experience of mind. Francisco says, we haven't touched at all on that really in the foregoing, and we have to bring that to the fore and deal with it directly. This is a crucial, um, this, this point, this crucial point is a precursor, of course, to something Francisco writes about much later. Here's an expression of it in the paper, Neurophenomenology, a Methodological Remedy for the Hard Problem, which I believe Antoine Lutz is going to present for us. So Francisco there puts this point by saying, in all functionalistic accounts, what is missing is not the coherent nature of the explanation, but it's alienation from human life. Only putting human life back in will erase that absence, not some extra ingredient or profound theoretical fix. So an extra ingredient here would be, for example, some kind of irreducible um, phenomenal mentality that we consider to be an extra property over and above the physical properties. That, that kind of um, philosophical solution is, is not really going to deal with the problem that we're facing there. Whatever other merits or non-merits it might have, it doesn't touch this problem. Francisco introduces a new star here. He says, consider the following star being slash knowledge where being means experience. Being goes on the left because it's out of being that thought and knowledge occur. Again, both sides mutually specify each other and that recognition raises us to a meta level. These statements, nevertheless, still belong to the domain of knowledge. That is, in a way, they're still on the right-hand side of knowledge rather than being. What's required, Francisco says, is a corresponding being. In other words, a corresponding experience, a direct experience, that is, of the interrelation of being and knowledge. And the crucial point is that we can't get this just by thought. That is the crucial point that we need a shift in experience isn't something that we can achieve just by thinking about it. It takes for Francisco some kind of pragmatics that is some kind of practice. And he sees this, this kind of being or experience as embodied in meditation and later more generally in phenomenology grounded in meditation. And remember, of course, the passage from Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind at the beginning, it's, it's the being or experience of body-mind posture that expresses not one, not two. 
And this brings us to another fundamental statement of Francisco's thinking. He says, a change in experience, being, is as necessary as change in understanding if any suturing the mind-body dualisms is to come about. And of course, remember that the mind-body dualism is a certain kind of cut that isn't just an intellectual cut. It's an intellectual cut embodied in certain cultural practices that, um, as we can see today, of course, especially, though this would have been said as well in the 1970s, that have led us into various kinds of, um, of, of crises. And this, of course, is a central theme of the embodied mind and Francisco's later work on neurophenomenology that we need this kind of experiential change, experiential shift or shift in being, not simply an intellectual uh, solution as it were to the mind to the mind body problem. So to conclude then, Francisco says the mind body problem turns out to be partly resolvable and partly not. The resolvable part is what eventually becomes the inactive approach where we see mind and body and organism and environment as mutually enfolded in each other, as not one, not two. The still to be resolved part is the need for a correlative shift in being or shift in experience in what Francisco calls the irreducible basis or the complementarity being slash knowledge. And of course, his later way of stating this also in the neurophenomenology paper is lived experience is where we start from and where we all must link back to like a guiding thread. So I will end my summary of the paper there. And I'm going to exit from the slides. And I need to stop share. There we go. Thank okay. you very much, Evan, for this beautiful presentation, extremely rich. Um, I loved how you contextualized the, the paper. Um, this is precisely what I meant when I said that um, it's a paper that has inspired me greatly because whenever I read it, I find these threads that lead to topics that, that, that I haven't really fully grasped uh, so far. And you know, now you've presented some of these topics uh, that were unknown to me or I've understood only very vaguely. So it's a very rich paper indeed. Um, so I'm kind of opening up more for the questions, but before I go to the very specific questions, I would like to ask you a, a, a general question, uh, um, a question of a more historical type, say. Um, it would seem to me uh, from my readings of Francisco's work so far that this is basically the paper where Francisco lays out the program that he then kind of tries to unfold through his works uh, most sy systematically. Um, what I was always a bit um, frustrate, frustrated with is the fact that he didn't really seem to follow up on this with say another paper of a similar sort where he would reflect on these things from a later perspective. What you get is basically um, precisely what you depicted at the very beginning of the, of the paper. So he kind of opens up the issue of the context and which specific segments we need to address if we want to solve the, the issue of the mind body problem. And then as you've uh, so beautifully showed uh, he um, kind of tries to develop different segments uh, where he does precisely that. So he tries to develop a different logics. He tries to develop different symbols and models and eventually even ways of cultivating different modes of experience. So I was just wondering whether you knew of, was he thinking of doing something like that? What, or, or do you know of any sketches, mm. outlines, any ideas, any anything of the sort because you know uh, it would seem that th there is something missing in all of this so he was developing these uh, individual segments but there was no synthesis uh, yeah. in a way yeah yeah um i think that uh so francisco had a certain style of of working that i think it is very much in a way um how the scientist works 
which is to you know formulate ideas that are generative of you know new experimental ideas of new you know theoretical modeling ideas and to constantly be sort of following the the edge of that into you know into new into new work and he whereas as as a philosopher you know you're a philosopher i'm a philosopher as philosophers we like to think well you know shouldn't you step back and you know you know, write out some sort of systematic summary. And, um, and I mean, that's how we, most of us as philosophers work, but Francisco didn't really work that way. And, and he even would say to me in conversation, he would say things like, well, you know, I'm not, that's what philosophers do. I don't, you know, I don't, I don't really, I don't really work that way. He's, he's kind of constantly carried on by, um, by the, uh, by the, 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 the ideas and, and then their, their sort of further, um, development very much in collaboration with other people as well. So, I mean, he worked with a number of philosophers, of course, and the philosophers that he worked with would do more of that kind of work. Um, so he didn't he didn't ever really write a summary. Uh, there are papers at di various phases of his work that summarize ideas. You know, his organism, a meshwork of selfless selves is very much a kind of summary paper of a number of different threads of his thinking about the organism and about life. Um, so, I mean, he did, of course, write papers that took stock at various stages, but he didn't write, you know, philosophical treatises uh, in in that sense. And then, of course, I mean, tragically, we we lost him young and, you know, he would be in his 70s if he were alive today and maybe he would be writing those things today, uh, I, you know, or, or maybe not. Maybe he would continue to be doing the same thing. I don't know. <laughs> Hey, marvelous. Thank you very much. Uh, I've received some really interesting questions. And interestingly enough, Evan, many of these are related <laughs> to your comment about Hegel. So uh -huh. I think I'll, <laughs> I'll let Andreas Weber ask the question. I'm not sure whether he'll ask the same question as other, people's, uh, other people have uh, asked, but I'm pretty sure that he will go in a somewhat similar direction. Yes, I, I, I won't even ask a question. I will just, just comment on this. But first also, Evan, let me thank you for this um, beautiful presentation. And um, I am I'm actually deeply fascinating by um, having a look at these early works, which I did not know so far, although I worked together with Francisco for a, a year in Paris and we published together and I know his um, later work uh, quite well, but I didn't know these. And I'm pretty... Um, fascinated um, how uh, of the scope and of the, 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 the radicality, let's say, but also of the way the, the later ideas are prefigured. So I, I really do see a, a sort of continuity. And what I'm going to say about Hegel is also related to this continuity. So when I, um, when I read that, that paper, um, like Evan, I was thinking, okay, did he really get Hegel right in this? Isn't that a little bit simplistic? Isn't that just, just like, my let's say basic understanding before delving a little bit deeper in, into Hegel and I think I think actually it is and um, and I mean it might in some respect it's it might be um, somehow right from a, from a, a very a detached viewpoint but if you if you look deeper into Hegel I think you fi you'll find that he was actually obsessed with the same problem um, uh, that Varela was, uh, that Francisco was, was dealing with. And you find very interesting comments on that. And I, I, I'll end up reading one to you from a beautiful paper on Hegel and, um, and purposiveness by an Italian colleague of mine. And, um, but just let me sketch the, the, the way where Hegel and Francisco meet to my eyes. And this is via the um, Hans Jonas connection which mm -hmm. where, 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 where I am also in, at play when I, when I came to, to his lab and brought this tradition with me. And Jonas is building on, um, it's not very much visible because he doesn't quote, he hides it somehow, but it, it's, clear, it's clear that he is building on the German um, biophenomenological romantic um, idealist tradition. So there's a line from Hegel to Schelling to Jonas. And, um, and this is about the, the unfolding um, individuality um, of the living um, within the whole of 
reality. So it's, it has to do with dialectics inevitably. And um, just, 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 just to finish, so that's, that was just a comment, but just let me just read a, a quotation um, from, um, I, have to, I think the, um, what work is it? Maybe, probably it's a phenomenology of mind of Hegel, but you can find it in that paper. And Hegel says, the living being is the syllogism whose very movements, moments are inwardly systems and syllogisms, but they are active syllogisms or processes. And within the subjective unity of the living being, they are only one process. And I hope um, it's clear that, that he is, Hegel is deeply into the, the, these, these things. And um, I actually never went deeper into this, but probably it's, it's, it would even be very interesting to, to, to go on, on fishing there and to find um, inspiring um, ideas. Okay, so that was it to Hegel and um, Francisco. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, thank you, thank you. Yeah, uh, I think even Francisco you know, himself would have said later that the use of the term Hegelian in not one, not two was, uh, you know, limited and, and, and problematic. And indeed, you know, in the later work that Francisco was doing, for example, with you, uh, his, you know, his thinking is, is very much, uh, and, and this marks a break also with the earlier work on autopoiesis, especially with, with Umberto Maturana, he, he's thinking about um, this kind of self-reference as, as actually constitutive of the living process, not simply as something that you you uh, have to look at the organism that way that sort of regulates your perception of the organism in a Kantian sense, but more in a Hegelian sense, it's actually constitutive of the living process itself. And 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 that way of looking at autopoiesis and self-reference is is I think very different from the earlier work on autopoiesis where, where teleology, for example, is um, something that's just a description from the domain of the observer. Uh, so it, it's all to say that I think, you know, of course, Francisco's thinking evolved a lot and I don't think he himself would uh, see that use of the word Hegelian as, you know, terribly accurate with regard to yeah. what Hegel actually said. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um... There's a powerful dialectical moment already at the very beginning um, of, uh, um, there was a, a powerful dialectical moment already at the very beginning of our presentation where we were talking about the doing and undoing. And Hane de Jäger has a question pertaining to that. So Hane, if you're ready, we would like to hear your question. Yes. I, I hope you can hear me because my mm -hmm. connection is quite bad. But um, yeah, I could, I'll say it and see if you can <laughs> hear you. You can hear yeah. us? Okay. Good. I hear you fine, yeah. Uh, perfect. Um, yeah, so I was wondering, you mentioned in the beginning the two key ideas and the idea yeah, the, that um, Francisco had said, we have to be able to undo what we have done. Um, and so... Uh, we need to do this superating of dualities and it requires moving to a meta level. And we need to do this if we are to enact and construct our world. Um, and this understanding must include now knowing how to undo that way of constructing and enacting. Um, and I was wondering, it seems so, this idea of undoing seems so antithetical to the whole idea of not one, not two, because it, mm -hmm. it has the idea that we can go back in time and not, it, it, and everything will be the same. And actually, I think what he, what the whole idea of not one, not two is, is um, that we move forward after we've done something with what we've done and incorporate that or encompass it um, mm -hmm. and then enact something on the basis of that, which will be changed by the doing, but it cannot be undone. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think un, un, undo their means or I wouldn't, I wouldn't read it this way anyway, mm -hmm. going back in a temporal mm -hmm. sense and in a logical sense to um, a way things were before that you enacted them, um, because that's extremely problematic and of course can't, can't actually be done. Um, it's, I think it's rather the idea that um, if you, if you make, for example, a certain kind of cut 
you you say this is the system and we're going to um, place value on this system differentiated this way. If you lose sight of your having done that and all the motivations and values that went into doing that, then you you in effect reify it and you don't see that there are, are alternatives that you can actually step back and say, no, I'm not going to cut it that way. So that's what I take undo to mean. I'm going to stop cutting it that way and I'm going to do it a different way. Now, I mean, there's a question in any given situation concretely, really, what would that mean and how would one do that? But, but, but that's, I think, conceptually what, what's going on there. Um, you know, if we think of it in terms of his own experience, I think the idea is that, you know, he talks about this in the reflections on the Chilean civil war, that, that everybody somehow had gotten caught up in constituting a reality that was absolutely divided and polarized. So that, you know, one newspaper said X, one newspaper said not X, you know, there's, I mean, this is almost, you know, the case in, you know, our world now writ large, right? So this fixation onto certain kinds of, um, ways that things are that we don't realize we've made them to be that way. And unless we see that, then there's no hope in having it be any other way. That's, that's how I understand what he's saying there. Mm. I, I find uh, strong resonance is what, what's being said here with, uh, with some of the ideas that Merleau-Ponty is developing where he's trying to contextualize the difference between actuality and virtuality. So uh, in, in the human perception uh, and correlatively human uh, action and behavior, um, every action that is actual is surrounded by the milieu of virtuality. So this is precisely the possibility of undoing what you're doing because there's always an uh, implicit possibility of engaging with other possibilities. So it's not like you've said necessarily negating in the sense of taking it back and going back in time and everything will stay the same, but your action is always al already also a potential on action, so to speak, because there are other possibilities and virtualities that surround it. Anyway, uh, a question that is um, that has again um, come in in different uh, forms, but was already formulated last time by Marijke Smolka, um, and it, it pertains, I'm going to paraphrase it somewhat and combine different questions together. It uh, pertains to the um, question of the relation between observation, uh, observer and, and indication. So in this story, we've seen that the observer is slowly coming to the foreground and that the observer plays a crucial role in basically constituting uh, in constituting differences that make a difference. So by making an indication, as we've said previously, you basically create the universe in which you somehow uh, operate and you are, and then you also co-create yourself by doing so. Now, the interesting question here is, and the one that uh, you and Francisco, uh, if I'm not mistaken, have discussed, discussed quite a lot. I think I've read this in either your book or in some other book in, in one of the footnotes. So the, the, the concept of construction versus, versus inaction. So the question is, mm. you know, how contingent, how autonomous how uh, spontaneous, so how free is the observer of making these distinctions? What does it mean that observer is the one that indicates? Is this something that is completely contingent as say radical constructivist would have it? And I know that you wouldn't have it. Uh, and I'm in agreement with this, uh, uh, about this uh, with you, but this question becomes important. So the observer enters the picture Observer is the one making distinctions, so differences that make a difference. But to what degree is this, say, a free act? And how should one conceptualize these freedoms? So how contingent are these things? Yeah, well, that's a huge question. Um, and uh, I mean, my own inclination with regard to a question like that is not to try to make a universal generalizing statement about um, what is the case, but always to refer it to concrete cases, um, you know, be they scientific or philosophical or artistic or political or, or, or what have you. Um, 
So, I mean, there, there, there is a sense in which it's always contingent in that it's always in a context dependent on communities of practitioners, circumstances, procedures and methods available, you know, that have a history. I mean, that's, that's a, a pile of contingencies, but the contingencies go very deep. Uh, so, you know, just because something is contingent doesn't mean that it might not be in some other sense mandatory um, or, or, or called for. Um, so I think, yeah, I, I mean, I don't think there's a, there's a, I mean, the word, so the word construction suggests that you're making something out of materials that are available to you antecedently, and you're doing it for, you know, maybe according to an explicit design or maybe not, maybe, uh, it's something that's uh, self-constructing and evolving. Maybe it's more deliberate. I mean, these are the kinds of things that are always dependent on the context. But I think, I suppose at the heart of, you know, to bring it back to not one, not two, and the network and the cut, at the, at the heart of this situation is, and, and of course, our tendency is going to try to be to think of this in a disjoint way. And so what we have to do is hold these two things together as mutually um, specifying the tendency is on the one hand to think the observer decides what the network is by drawing boundaries. The other is to think, well, no, there is a difference where we have a network in which all the arrows are, you know, interlocking in this recursive way. That kind of network brings itself forth from out of a background in in the in, you know in the in in the ways that. Uh, that Francisco tried to formalize in the materials that we talked about last time. And so it's not just up to the observer. The observer is there faced with something that is self-individuating itself. Now, the observer can always choose to ignore that or choose to emphasize something else. So it's, I mean, it's a conversational domain in, in, um, in the sense of, of, of not one, not two. And it's very difficult to think those two things together. And, and that is, I think that's the task actually is to think think those two things together because you know Spencer Brown at the beginning of Laws of Form just to you know connect this back to last week again I think the first sentence of Spencer Brown's Laws of Form is something like a universe comes into being when a space is severed or taken apart it's in the passive voice a space is severed or taken apart he doesn't say when an observer makes you know a cut so the system can you know, individuate and sever a space and, and, you know, enact in that sense. And then of course there can be an observer involved in that as well. So that's the really difficult thing to think is to think both of those things together and not to fall back onto emphasizing one or the other. Yeah. I think that processual thinking here is very useful because uh, the passive voice that you mentioned in Spencer Brown is particularly helpful and useful because uh, um, you don't say that the observer makes the cut because the observer becomes what he is at when he makes the cut. So the process of cutting constitutes not only right. the reality, but the observer himself. Right. And when the That's reality right. is constituted, there are new possibilities open. And whenever something is done, observer is born as well. So there's this ongoing exactly. uh, dynamics. Anyway, a uh, question from YouTube um, that is related to what, uh, partly somewhat related to what we were uh, um, talking just now, what we've been talking about just now. Uh, it's by Randolph Diebel, 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 I don't know, I'm mispronouncing this. Uh, I apologize for, for distorting the name. Uh, is the shift of making explicit of the observer, that is to say of starring the mind-body dualism and so on, expressed by the calculus of self-reference. How is the, let, uh, the later phenomenology related to the calculus? So if I understand this correctly, last time, uh, or, or, um, um, last time and also now, we talked about uh, the act of indication being at the very foundation of the calculus of self-reference that was uh, drawing on the ideas uh, put forward in, um, uh, um, uh, by, by Spencer Brown. So how does this then relate to um, later work on phenomenology and an action where you also have this perception and mo movement being 
mutually co correlated, co-determined, and so on and so forth. So if you could maybe comment on this. So the early work on uh, calculus of self-reference, very formal, and then later phenomenology, but it seems to have a, a common thread, this notion of action, of movement, of doing, of indicating, of enacting somehow. Hmm. Um, yeah, that's an interesting question. I mean, I, I, I think, so, so Lewis, who I think is here, is much, a, much better able to comment on the, you know, the early mathematical and logical work. I, you know, I, I see Francisco as at that point working with those kinds of logical and mathematical tools to try to articulate and understand self-reference and um, the the broader context philosophically is what he sets forth in not one, not two. Then his thinking, you know, moves on in the way that we were talking about last time. And he doesn't really work with that work as much anymore. He He develops trying to look at particular kinds of biological networks like the immune network or you know the 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 visual system or then later um, you know neural networks associated with with consciousness and and perceptual recognition and the mathematical tools shift there I mean he he starts working you know a lot well I suppose he always did but I mean he's really working with the tools of nonlinear dynamical systems theory uh, in that work so I don't see a direct kind of path that goes from the work on self-reference into those into those other works. I see it more as kind of ramifying of ideas in in different directions in different contexts with 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 different methods. So if I understand the sense of the question, that's the general kind of response I would give. I'd like okay. to make a comment if I could. Of course, of course. Um, if you go back to the the source of the calculus of self-reference, it's Spencer Brown, of course. And if you think about the beginning in Spencer Brown, then the mark mm -hmm. is exactly like Francisco's slash. Mm. It participates in the two sides, and it makes the two sides by its presence. Uh, and it is an embodied self-reference. Just as the slash is a self-reference, so is the mark in Spencer Brown, referential to the distinction that it makes between the two sides or to the joining of the two sides. So this is a more embodied uh, uh, position about self-reference uh, than the re-entering mark may appear to be formally. Hmm. And so I think that the, uh, that if you think about that, then you can indeed see something of the relationship between those beginnings and the rest, embodied mind, neurophysiology, neurophenomenology, and so on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's beautiful. Thank you. If I just can can follow up with an, with another comment, and 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 thanks to for for this. Um, to me, um, Francisco has just followed his own. Um, suggestion um, that we need to become more and more experiential and um, um, and what he, what he is doing then uh, more and more becomes an, an in a sort an embodiment um, or an, an action of, of the first more formal formulations I'd say and and um, um, and and in this he becomes more and more radical and less and less um, bound to to the let's say the the, the mere formal logic, and and then he wa also s somehow walks out of the relatively formal way of um, thinking um, he, ha he has developed together with Maturana, I'd say. But I, I think, and for me, this is so fascinating that he he's very true to um, to what he started with. That that was so fascinating that I, I've, I've seen um, this this. Um, very abstract and very neat formulation in this first papers. And I also see a clear um, connection, like Lou said, between the, the paper we're discussing today and, and the calculus for self-reference. It's, it's very obvious to my, to my eyes. Um, so um, so I, I, it's, it's somehow he it does what he's, what he's suggesting, I'd, I'd say. And so he leaves behind this, this other stuff because he's, he's becoming more and more embodied in a way.
Okay, uh, uh, on the note of still self-referentiality -refer and the early work, uh, Giovanna has a question about the relation between the star and self-referentiality. And I was thinking whether Giovanna could perhaps expound on this a little bit so that we know what exactly this is um, referring to so or what precisely you're interested in. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Evan, so much for the presentation and nice to see you. And to thank you, you for going so much detail into those really tricky points. I'm still getting my mind around and I'm, I'm still swimming in high waters here. <laughs> but I think this topic was already touched uh, in actually what Sebastian, you said and what um, uh, Louis Kaufman was saying. So I, I just um, I'm still struggling to understand the link between this, the, um, the star and uh, self-referentiality. I missed it completely the first time I read the paper and then you said it in your presentation but didn't elaborate it. And I, I mean, I have some hypotheses about what, what, what the link is but I'm really not confident about it. So I wonder whether you could just say something more about it. Can you articulate the, 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 the way, the, the sense in which the, the, the star um, I don't know, is self-referential, implies self-referentiality, self-referentiality? Because mm -hmm. in the back of my mind, I suspect this has to do with then the question of, uh, yeah, what, what uh, Sebastian was saying before, the, the observer. Is the observer that is perhaps needed there to make the link between the two parts of the, of the star? And that's where there is a refer reference to, to the self, but maybe this is totally on the wrong, in the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think I think Lewis just you know put it really quite beautifully. Um, so when you have when you have the star or the or the slash, the slash the slash creates a left side and a right side, and we're supposed to read the slash as consider both what's on the left and what's on the right. So that's already self-referential because um, the slash is an injunction to consider itself as a slash that separates or, or not maybe separates, but distinguishes or differentiates a left from a right where the left is what leads to the right. And then in terms of the dialectical evolution, of course, so like left is body, right is mind. Um, or left is, um, you know, predator prey interactions and right is ecosystem or left is, you know, a network, sorry, right is a no, left, left is network, right is, you know, the trees that constitute the network. So you have a, you have a distinction made, but the distinction calls attention to itself as a distinction in which you're supposed to consider the things being distinguished as generative of themselves. So, so that's the, I think the kind of heart of the self-referentiality in the case of the star. So we can look at it, I mean, we can look at it in an abstract formal way, and then we can look at it concretely in terms of the, the actual processes that we're considering from these perspective and how they are um, looping and generative of, them, of themselves and, and refer back or recursively constitute themselves in the case of say mind and body or conversation and participants or whole and parts or you know whatever it whatever it might be so that's that's in general terms how i would see the self-reference at work there but I'm, I'm sure lewis could actually say much more about about this from a mathematical point of view than than certainly that i could Lewis, would but, you like but to feels add? that he must be quiet now about that. <laughs> okay, then uh, I would, uh, I think Giuseppe has a question uh, or maybe a comment, not sure. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Ivan. Nice to see you. And thanks for the great talk and also about these historical and personal uh, recollections that make the the matter come alive. Uh, my question was about the, um, the passage that you cited where Francisco said, uh, alluded to um, going beyond the, the usual 
logical dialectic of uh, thesis, antithesis, and synthesis by introducing some sort of um, a different level uh, that um, you said it was something related to meditation or to the posture. And to me, that, that, uh, that really struck me because I don't know if you are familiar with, the, um, with that famous koan about thinking about non-thinking that Dogen uh, um, mm -hmm. recalls in his uh, Zazen, uh, Zazen Shin. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's really very, very similar in, uh, I'm gonna read it from uh, the Hijin um, Kim on his book, Dogen on Meditation and Thinking, where it says, talking about this different level, which goes above uh, thesis, antithesis, and synthesis even. And it says, non-thinking, hishiryo, is the mind-body-based practice of seated meditation that revitalizes both thinking and not thinking, and therefore promotes the creative interplay between the rational and the non-rational. Non-thinking is praxis, not theoria, gnosis, or logos. I found it very, very in line with what uh, with the passage that you cited. So I wonder if you can comment on that. Yeah, I think... Um... I'm trying to think of, of exactly the right way to go to the heart of this, but there is, um, well, there's the whole question of paradox that's lurking throughout all of this, I suppose would, would, would be what I am inclined to see. Um, it's, so not one, not two is, is paradox. Um, you know, in Dogen, you know, practice is enlightenment. That's paradoxical because on the one hand, no, practice isn't enlightenment because we think of practice as what we need to do to attain enlightenment. But if we think of it that way, then we will forever thwart the realization of awakening. But if we think that we're already awakened, um, that's no good either, um, because then you know we don't need to do anything. So I mean, there's there's a there's a paradox that's lurking there. It's the same as the paradox of um, you know mountains and rivers. Are mountains and rivers, mountain and rivers aren't mountains and rivers, mountains and rivers are mountains and rivers. Well, the third one, is it the same as the first one? Well, yes, it has to be, but no, it can't be. So the the relation of all this to the not one, not two paper, and here I would actually maybe I didn't raise any critical, you know, questions in my presentation, other than maybe just the aside about, well, is this really what's going on in Hegel? Um, but if I were to raise a critical question, it would, it would be something along the lines of the idea that you can just transition to a meta level that somehow resolves the situation. Hmm. It, it's, it seems to me that, um, I mean, there's a sense in which, yes, if you see in the star, the self-reference and the mutual, you know, the imbrication and the asymmetry, of course, that's a different perception, which requires taking up a different stance. So in a sense, that's a meta level. But it's still but, in the logos. It's still yeah, in the but theory. It's, it's, so it, that's the interesting right. thing is that this moves um, beyond the paradox. And you cannot, in a sense, you cannot solve the paradox with the mind alone. You need something else. And that yes, is provided and that, by the acting body, in a sense. Right. I mean, that's very much how Francisco, I think, mm -hmm. thought about it. Um, he thought that there needed to be a kind of radical shift in experience. And this was what attracted him to, at that time, to, to Trumpa, who is, of course, mm -hmm. an extremely problematic figure, and um, also to, to the articulation of those ideas in Zen and Madhyamaka is that you needed to have a kind of radical experiential existential transformation. And that wasn't gonna come about just by thinking. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, that is itself an example of, if you say it that way, a disjoint pair. Mm -hmm. That is that there's thinking, which is logos, and then there's you know 
call it what you will, intuition, insight, you know, jhana, you know, non-conceptual, you know, cognition, whatever you want to call it. If you set it up that way, then you're just right back in dealing no, but with that, yeah, the dichotomy. But that, yeah, but that is uh, exactly what Dogen says. There is uh, what he call uh, uh, shiryo, which is the logical thinking. He shiryo, which is the the antithesis, the, the non-rational, the intuitive. But then there is he shiryo, which is a kind of a meta, but is not does not pertain to the mental level alone. You need the praxis to go beyond that duality. So that uh, uh, it's very interesting for me that Francisco seemed to seem to have written something very much in line with that. Oh, definitely. I mean, I think that's why that's why it's called not one, not two, and where yeah. I think he's taking that from is Suzuki Roshi. So that I mean, that is the way he's thinking about it. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you, Giuseppe, for the question. And I would like to follow this up with a question from YouTube, which is actually, uh, I would say, related somewhat to what was uh, what has just been said, and it might even help to shed a, a, a clearer light on what has been uh, exchanged right now. Um, so um, there's a comment by MPAGN. Uh, I'm not even going to try to pronounce this. Um, uh, the star statement is presented as consider both it and the process leading to it. If I substitute being and knowledge, I get I consider being and the knowledge leading to it. But this seems very confusing. I also cannot make sense of being knowledge graphically with the diagram showing the imbrication of the term. So the question here is precisely this relation between being we, that we can maybe spell out as existence or lived experience and knowing probably conceived of as some sort of uh, conceptual slash propositional knowledge. So maybe Evan, if you could um, say a few words on that. Yeah. Um, so there's, there's a question about whether you can just use the slash kind of we don't want to use the slash indiscriminately. So when he writes being slash knowledge, we, we have to ask, well, what is he trying to express by that? And it looks like what he's trying to express is the idea. I mean, he says earlier that what goes on the left is, you know, holistic. What goes on the right is constitutive. So if, if we read it that way, then the idea is that there is a non- objectified background of experience of being in which knowledge is situated but, but knowledge is also um, stands in a in a in a generative relationship to it so then we have to ask well what kind of knowledge well um, it's not going to just be propositional uh, knowledge. It's going to also have to include things like, you know, know-how. I mean, there's different kinds of knowledge, right? There's, there's, you know, descriptive propositional knowledge. There's skillful practical knowledge. Um, and I don't think we want to limit the meaning of the word knowledge just to the descriptive and propositional there, or there's nothing in the text that indicates we should take it that way. So I think, again, in reading this text, there are places where you can you can find quite a bit of precision, um, the kind of precision you would find in you know a, a treatise in you know math or logic, that kind of precision. And then there's other places where he's just clearly working with ideas and he's trying to articulate something. Um, and so I see being slash knowledge as a situation where he's basically saying, here we are, we've set out some ideas about the mind body problem. Nonetheless, there's still a problem. What's the nature of the problem? Well, here's a way of looking at it on the basis of what we've said so far. And now we have to, we have to go further, uh, even from that. Okay. Marvelous. Um, now, there are several other questions out there. Uh, 
I think you know, and, that... and Lewis keeps putting putting these incredibly rich comments in chat. Yeah, that are precisely. Because so uh, <laughs> they're so rich. <laughs> uh, Liam had a question, but I'm not sure whether he's still here. Um, if if he is, maybe Liam. Yeah. Well, I, I was sure. I can just say that um, I would be interested in the because there's a. a question about remaining in, in Logos and is the point for Francisco to suggest different ways of looking because the easiest way to emptiness or to be beyond, uh, to be in that beyond state is to realize that there's different ways of looking. So as long as you suggest anything that's consistent, but different way of looking, it frees the mind to enter into that state beyond either, you know, practice or or logic and is, is that also part of this would be the question I'm not, I'm not quite sure I got exactly the question can you can you say, say again okay if anytime one suggests this, so or if we say that there's only processes not objects you you could dispute or undispute as long as you defend that as a as a internally consistent way of looking, it undermines the belief in objects, which is the, the thing that people are highly attached to. So regardless of whether or not we are trying to suggest a completely consistent logical way of looking, nevertheless, the perspective of, of the anybody who considers this, what he's offering is somehow freed to enter into a state which is not within logic and is is that not part of what what he's attempting to do with maybe even with this paper and for himself it's just liberatory some people use the word liberatory in philosophy mm -hmm. uh, for that kind of pursuit yeah i okay i think i see um i uh, there's clearly an aspect of it that involves trying to um undo a certain way of looking at things and give us another way of looking at things. So it's not just an undoing. I mean, one, one kind of project would be just undo things and then, and then there you are, things are undone. Um, but he's doing more than that. He's, he's trying to orient our thinking and perception in a particular direction that includes making space for a kind of experiential self-transformation that he thinks is ultimately necessary in order to deal with the mind-body problem. So I, I mean, there is a liberatory aspect in the sense in which you're using the word, but I think there's actually more going on there. That's, um, yeah. I would expect that. I mean, only to say that one does not have to believe that he is totally enamored with his logic and thinks that it's complete in order oh, to no. think that it's value, right? Right. No, so. no, there's, that's right. There's no reason to think that. But, but by, so, I mean, for example, by way of contrast, um, you know, I mentioned that he was very influenced by Nagarjuna and Madhyamaka philosophy, the, the Buddhist philosophy of the middle way. So Nagarjuna's argumentation in the Madhyamaka Karakas is, entirely negative. He, it proceeds in a destructive way. It basically says, if you assume this, here's the absurd consequence. If you assume that, here's the absurd consequence. And the absurdity is always premised, the, the absurd consequence is always premised on assuming that there's a certain kind of, you know, non-relational intrinsic being that something, that something has. And so Nagarjuna's arguments are purely kind of reductio, destructive arguments. So Francisco is not doing that kind of thing in this paper. Um, he's, he's actually offering an alternative uh, perspective that, that works constructively with ideas like the star and with imbrication and self-reference and, and, and so on. But, but Liam probably has a point, and of course, Evan, it would seem that you agree with this, that this is not to say that, you know, you, you can kind of um, erect an ultimate model or conception of whatever yeah. because that would basically basically be overstepping the the sure. the fundamental star knowledge so yeah uh, no, by doing course. this because of course yeah so uh, a question 
from Ezekiel about um, how to interpret um, dialectics, but not in a formal way. So mm -hmm. that, that's, uh, that's might be interesting. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you, Evan. Uh, I really enjoyed thinking about these things. I mean, I have a comment, but it's a question too, um, that has to do with, uh, is provoked by the discussion that we are having now. And I, to some extent, believe that perhaps the kind of discussion we're having now is probably deviating a little bit from the spirit of the paper and bringing in dialectics, perhaps in the way he brought in the paper, invites this sort of discussion, obviously. Uh, I think um, dialectics is, is a much more practical method. Um, and when you raise the questions, uh, the, I think it was about how do you go to the meta level and so on. I don't think that he could propose a formal way of, of answering that question. I believe that what happens is that uh, there is indeed an element of practice in, in dialectics and that element of practice has to do with what is relevant to us situated observers today, right now, uh, what we're investigating, who we're working with, what are our worries. And that in a sense is in my understanding of dialectics as a method uh, at the heart of dialectics. In fact, dialectics has also been uh, defined as a method from going from the abstract to the concrete. And I like very much the later work uh, by Francisco Varela on making it concrete. Um, and then this is fact, in fact, it's been happening at the heart of all the inactive approach, the developments in the inactive approach, as you mentioned in your own book. Uh, but in, in, there are many, many dialectical moves, but they're not formalized. They're just presented as, hey, follow this path and you will see that these two oppositions, in fact, they have an underlying internal relation. Uh, or look at these two concepts that seem to be disconnected, but start looking at their, at their implications and you start seeing some contradictions or some tensions. What will be the stage at which you need to observe this in order to resolve that tension? So dialectics in that sense serves more as a method that invites your thinking to change adaptively and concretely in the situation in which you are. So I don't think we should, and this is my opinion, we should look for very general methodological answers of how we, we're gonna apply this here, how we go to the meta level there. I think we have to use it. Uh, it's sort of mental surfing. Uh, we need to just learn it and use it. Sorry, that wasn't a question in the end. No, no, that's great. That's great. I, I agree completely with that. I think, um, I mean, that you said much better what I was trying to say at one point earlier on when I said, I don't think there's a general universal answer. Um, it was the question about contingencies, I guess. I think it always depends on, mm. you know, the context, the situation, our collaborators, our methods and things like that. No, I, I think that's, I think that's quite right. The worry I was raising about going to a meta level, meta level wasn't so much a procedural worry about, you know, what's the logic involved it was it was actually in a way more a concrete worry which is you know if you try to go to a meta level too quickly you might actually miss some things that are really important yes um there may be some tensions there that you don't want to prematurely resolve by just jumping to a meta level and that was more what was actually in the back of my mind, that was that was more the worry, which I think resonates with what you just said, is that actually we're dealing with concrete situations. And if we if we presume that we think we can find a meta level and resolve them, we we may actually really miss some very crucial things. That's right. Yes, it's almost like like the method is, is also transformative of how you are observing and how the possibilities of thinking that you can bring into the situation. And therefore, if you just jump, you essentially you just miss a, a segment of the path that you need to walk in order right. to get there. Exactly. Exactly. I think That's right. as as a rule of thumb, I would say try to see whether you have a, a, a spirit of minimalism to say like, well, what would be the the very basic uh, tension here and the very the simplest way in which it could be resolved that would take us mm -hmm. somewhere else, and from there, which is what we try to do in, in the book and in Mystic Bodies, I mean, we try to yeah. just go the, to the next thing because precisely what happens when you jump is that you you just missed everything that was in between and uh but there is no rule for that <laughs> no there's like no rule that's know. right 
That's you right. have to know as an observer or, or, or your skills or, or the context of the community in which you're working, they will tell you this is, is relevant. Don't jump over this bit because it's, right, it's important. Right. That's right. I mean, and that speaks to the importance of having a kind of uh, sensitivity or, or capacity for, um, I mean, you could call it different kinds of things for a kind of empathetic perception or sympathy or sensitivity or, I mean, and also understanding where you're actually attuned to the particularities of that situation that are not replaceable by any other one. Um, exactly. And of course, I mean, this is something Francisco would have, would have uh, certainly rec- you know, did indeed recognize himself. Yeah. Uh, Ezekiel, if you don't mind, and maybe Evan can also um, contribute to this, um, it would be probably interesting to see an example of two of dialectics at work. So maybe how what we've just said could be applied maybe to the question of language or to living systems or whatnot. It can be well, a very simple example. That's why I mentioned the book, you know, uh, <laughs> yeah. linguistic exactly. bodies. I mean, that is that is a is that whole book, I think, very um, much exemplifies this. I could I could give you one example of how I see dialectics applied to a concrete question that has to do with autopoiesis. Uh, and, and I think it is in the spirit of what we're saying here, although you may still need to translate certain parts, but um, I don't think we have discussed the definition of autopoiesis in, in the previous seminar, or maybe we will soon, but what you have, I'm paraphrasing very quickly, you have the definition of autopoiesis as a system uh, composed of a network of processes that through the operation of processes realizes itself in the relations between the processes. So it, it realizes itself, it self produces, and it also distinguishes itself from topologically from the environment. So you have like two conditions there. Let's call it self-production and self-distinction. Now in the original literature, this is a point of discussion, but this, this, this two are, are just put there like, you have to have this and that jointly uh, connected. But you might ask the question, uh, I mean, well, does one imply the other? Does, uh, could I put it just be self-production and not self-distinction? And it turns out that uh, you can make a dialectical analysis of these two and find that they're not one, not two, essentially. That, that uh, if you take self-production, I mean, this is by, expanding your perspective and taking a look at the organism in relation to the environment. And if you say, what kind of relation to the environment would benefit self-production? You know, if you try to think isolatedly, self-production on its own, well, it would be a relation to the environment where all the interactions somehow are useful to me. None, inter- none of the interactions are harmful. Imagine if that's possible, everything would be fine and I could make use of all the possibilities. Uh, of the environment. But to do that, eventually I'm just dissolving into the environment. I'm, st- I'm not this thing if I'm going to use absolutely every possible interaction with the environment that's beneficial for my life. And then if you, so self maximizing self-production negates self-distinction. And if you try to maximize self-distinction, what would be the best possible way to make sure that nothing will interfere with your distinction from the environment? Well, you just build a wall around yourself. And that wall will prevent you from any, any sort of, of, of uh, interventions that would just uh, you know, break your distinction from the environment. But that essentially means that you cannot survive because you need to exchange light, matter and energy from, with the environment. So self-distinction negates self-production if you maximize it. So what is actually happening here? You, well, you have two, an opposition between these two ideas and then The way to do that is to apply a a dialectical move to say, well, what if you introduce time and you realize that you can adaptively self-produce by taking advantage of some inputs from the environment, but stopping others so that you can self-distinct still. And your self-distinction is also realized through processes of adaptivity that are maintained by self-production. So if you bring them all together, you get a synthesis, if you want to call it like that, which is closer to the concept of agency that has been later developed in, in an active approach. So that's an example of, of how you can apply dialectical thinking. 
marvelous thank you very much this was this was really beautiful <laughs> um now uh the final question um i'll try to again combine several questions into one um and it's basically a question um that goes approximately in the following direction. How would you see bringing this critical perspective? So the idea of dialectics that we talked about and cultivating this dialectics, both with regards to the so, uh, topics and objects of inquiry and also with regards to how one conducts one's inquiry. So how would one bring this critical perspective um, and this idea of doing with undoing into the practicing communities and say policy making. There have there have been a lot of discussions about um, about finding ways to produce, so to speak, contemplative researchers, scientists, inquirers. Um, so how could one do this? And how did Francesco Francisco Varela himself? do this in his own practice so how did he embody and embody he did uh, these uh, elements in his own practice and how could this then be translated into useful say strategies uh, in policy making in the practicing communities and so on and so forth maybe a few words on that uh, by Evan and anybody else uh, if anybody else would well, again, I mean, I don't think that's a kind of question that admits of a general answer because there are different communities with different concerns and interests. You know, there are there are research scientific communities. There are um, okay. There Evan, are... Maybe if we if we specify this mm -hmm. to make it a bit a bit for you to also answer. Say, how would the two of us as practicing philosophers? incorporate this into our everyday activity. For me personally, it would seem that this would mean going in a certain sense back to what was done in the ancient Greece, you know, where philosophy was not merely, say, an intellectual endeavor, but something that was profoundly uh, existential in the sense of that involved what uh, Pierre Adot called mm. uh, spiritual practices, for instance. Uh, so, you know, philosophers and say practicing scientists in, in a laboratory, how could they somehow use this in their work, in your view? I, I, again, I mean, I think um, even there, I would resist a general kind of answer, actually. I think that um, what's, what's important is the kind of thing we're doing now where we bring these ideas out for people to encounter. We have a conversation in which many different perspectives interact with each other. And then it's really up to you know, individual scientists and philosophers how they're going to move forward you know, with that. I mean, I, I have certain things that I try to do in my philosophical teaching that you know, brings out more of the... Um, that, you know, that doesn't think of philosophy as just an intellectual exercise of analysis, but, you know, brings out its, its you know, its existential meaning and, and significance. Of course, you know, I try to do that in my own work as a, as a writer, in my teaching and the way I teach my students. That's just one particular individual's way of, way of doing it. I don't think, um, I would not, and I don't think well, I, I, won't, I won't say what Francisco would have said or thought because I, I don't want to do that. I'll, I'll just say that I don't think that one should simply think that, oh, what we need to do is to practice meditation along with reading philosophy. I, I think that that's, that's very simplistic and naive. I think a practice, you know, so this, pa I've, I've mentioned that because in this paper, there's this idea of a kind of different way of knowing that he sees as embodied in meditation. But of course, if we're going to actually talk about that in a richer way, we would have to say, but meditation is itself conceptually framed. It's embodied in traditions that have certain intellectual understandings of what it is and what its purpose is, even if they're so-called anti-intellectual traditions like Zen that try to thwart the intellectual that nevertheless have this incredibly rich textual tradition and liturgy. So, 
it would be a very, I think, confused idea to simply think that, oh, we should all just start meditating and that's going to somehow, you know, be the, the recipe. I think, I don't think there is a recipe in that sense. I think, you know, Francisco's journey was an intensely personal one. And that's why I tried to give some of the backstory of his, you know, his personal story. And, and he was constantly evolving in how he dealt with these kinds of questions. And, and that's what we all have to do. I mean, we, we all have to deal with it that way. That said, creating these kinds of communities that we're having right now, I think helps all of us, you know, to find our own way to do that. Marvelous. That's, and that's a very good point as well uh, with regards to meditation, because meditation in all the, all the traditions is basically embedded into a very variegated context, which includes many other uh, practices and many other ways of approaching the, 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 um, the topics um, that one studies. Um, and some of them are profoundly conceptual, so very rational. Uh, say in the Theravada tradition uh, and even in Zen to a certain degree so uh, that's a very good point that just you know having this idea that you have a scientist who does his own work but in addition to this he or she also meditates and this will somehow miraculously add an embodied element to it uh, is a bit naive but it is maybe a step in the right direction in the sense of thinking about different modes of knowing and how one could cultivate them. So basically opening up, opening up the space of uh, legitimate ways and modes of knowing in contemporary academia, which is in itself already a, a pretty daring thing to do. And I think Anika would like to comment on all of this. Uh, yes, thank you, Sebastian. I just, I think I wanted to say, um, and maybe with reference also to Wolfgang Lukas and other people involved in the Mindful Researchers or other initiatives that are close to me, just to say like there are more people, I feel like I'm speaking for more people now. Um, but for me, uh, it's not about maybe, I, I don't mean to say this could be a general answer, but maybe there can be examples um, and for me, examples would be uh, any sort of meeting that like, like, like the form of a listening circle where everybody shares stories from their background or there's time to hear everybody's voice or practice or frames for meeting that somehow bring in uh, embodied awareness and um, or yeah, space for maybe movement even as we meet. So um, I guess those things, they come to mind for me as examples of that also put this into practice. Um, and I just wanted to shortly mention this here. And, and not only this in a more technical sense, but also the attitude uh, of collaboration, like an attitude where you constantly try to remain open to, um, be surprised by the other's views or, or to change your group view, but maybe I'm getting too abstract. Uh, anyway, <laughs> thank you. No, I think that was actually very concrete and very clear. So uh, does anybody else have anything to add to this? So uh, the idea of applying these methods or methods that are similar to the ones that are expounded in the paper into say uh, contemporary academia, contemporary scientific mm. research. Gabor? Or was yes, that just a you. cough? Yeah, no, thank you Sebastian, <laughs> that, that's wonderful. Maybe just one comment that uh, I, I find it really interesting when someone claims that he is applying or she is applying something. I think it's important that with that statement, you also uh, include the possibility of not really applying it. Uh, we tend to fall into the traps of methods and applications very often. And we tend to claim that we do something or we achieve something with that doing. But if we keep the, the, the learning of today's uh, discussion, the the element of undoing with the doing the way i would translate it is questioning the doing while doing it that questioning invites the open space of uh, undoing not necessarily claiming that you are doing something into the activity that you are doing and that's that that dichotomy or that 
dialectics is, I think, important to keep in mind. Otherwise, we uh, tend to fall into the traps of uh, some uh, fanaticism or some uh, quick solutions. So it's just a comment. Thank you, Gabor. Uh, and I think that's a very useful and valid comment because uh, it would seem that the criterion for what counts as a justified authentic methodology is founded on, on the idea of algorithm. And if you have this as the prototype of what constitutes a solid and justified methodology, then basically everything that does not meet this particular criteria is not a proper methodology. So this is also why people always are look on a lookout for techniques. Give me a technique, give me a very a well-defined technique, which is in a certain sense in its essence, essence um, algorithmic, and if I do A and B, it follows C, D. So you have something of that kind. So there is um, a certain ideal uh, that was, that has developed in a specific uh, point in time, uh, early modern philosophy. And it would seem that it has sedimented as one of the ideals that is still permeating the, the academic realm and uh, uh, serves as an implicit ideal or a norm in light of which different methodologies are somehow judged, it would seem. It would be an interesting uh, point for further reflection and discussion. Anyway, I think that Evan did a really, really good job here. And uh, <laughs> I think that uh, we've all become a bit tired. So at this point, I would really, really like to take, thank you, Evan, again. Thank both you. for a lovely presentation and for very interesting uh, answers. And I would also like to thank all the participants, both here at the Zoom meeting and those that are watching this on YouTube. Uh, thank you for all the interesting questions. Thank you for all the interesting comments. I apologize for not uh, pass on all the questions and comments, but there were just too many. I tried to synthesize some. Um, um, anyway, um, uh, the next meeting is in two weeks. Uh, we will have Tom Fruse presenting, uh, presenting Francisco's work on uh, autonomy of living beings. So something that is closely related both to today's topic and the previous topic. Thank you again, Evan. Thank you again. Thank you. Everybody thank else, you. organizers, Amy, Gavor, and uh, uh, the, the Metanoia and Mind and Life group. And I'll be seeing you in 14 days. Be <laughs> thank well. you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.